region. Um, and right now we're going to move on to the second topic, which is the traditional actors and new players in the region, the, the role of um, global actors in the MENA. Uh, today, I will, uh, in this discussion, we will start with uh, Magdalena Kirchner. Um, she is the IPC fellow at the um, Sabanji University. And Magdalena, I want to start with you, and then let's start with the most traditional actor that the region has known recently, the United States. The U.S. has been the most prominent actor in the region in the, uh, we can say, post-World War II. The main discussions in the region right now is that U.S. is retracting from the region. Would you say that U.S. is actually um, retreating? And if so, would you say that's the nature of the, uh, what's the nature of this retraction? And also, could you also elaborate a little bit more to us on the um, grounds for American interests and um, threat perceptions in the region? and how these interests and perceptions are f affecting the American involvement. Uh, thank you, Dana. Uh, good morning. Um, yeah, thank you for the invitation and the well, luxury to put on an American hat without being an American. Um, but uh, to address your, your question, of course I want to challenge um, the hypothesis that um, the U.S. is in retreat, or at least that we can see it on a material base, and we probably have to talk more about a the narrative of retreat from the U.S. perspective. Why is the the Middle East not seen as a region of opportunities, but more as a burden? Um, and why is there a sense of a need to retreat? And then, and I think that's also maybe a good opening for our discussion. How is that perceived by the actors in the region? Why is retreat, and how is retreat discussed here? And what does it mean for other extra-regional actors and the patterns they interact with the U.S.? I mean, look into the region after the Second World War. Um, U.S. interests are pretty straightforward on five pillars. Um, the first is, is securing uh, the flow of oil, the Strait of Hormuz. Um, when I say U.S. interests, I think for me at least it's important that U.S. itself is not seeing only this as a bilateral flow um, towards the region, but also represents other extra-regional allies, especially Europeans. But if you consider that, for instance, energy flows to Japan go through 80% through the Strait of Hormuz, then um, U.S. is also representing the interest of others uh, when looking towards the region. The second is the security of the State of Israel, um, which is especially vocal in this administration, but was clearly also a goal of the of the past administrations, which is also like a traditional um, goal of U.S. Uh, policy in the Middle East. Support of friendly Arab regimes. Um, I think that's certainly something that we will discuss, but from the security perspective, this is especially important since the 70s when there was already a feeling that we can't be everywhere. Um, once there is a war that demands U.S. resources outside of the, outside of the region, we need to look to not necessarily proxies, but powers that share our interests and we can delegate, um, that we can delegate the burden to secure the region too. Um, this was in the 70s, in the 80s, it was certainly different uh, in the interpretation. That leads me to the fourth point, um, because in 1983, after the collapse of the U.S. twin pillar system, um, CENTCOM was established and the military footprint of the U.S. in the region um, expanded, well not dramatic, but certainly uh, substantially, and it, that's the case until today. So the security of U.S. military personnel and bases in the region is a fourth point, and the fifth, and that's certainly also since the 80s, but more, uh, more recently dominating the, the discourse of U.S. policy towards the Middle East is the fight against terrorism and, and radicalism. So I would not say that these goals have changed. Um, there's certainly um, still important on the agenda. What has changed is the narrative and the idea how the U.S. can actually achieve these, um, these goals. The first is a deep sense of pessimism uh, towards the region that we saw under Obama that we also see under Donald Trump. Although you would say that Donald Trump has changed his rhetoric towards the Arab leaders, that he's like dancing, a sword dance, and uh, tries to, to accommodate them, um, when he talks about the Middle East, it's like, it's quicksand for American dollars, trillions of uh, dollars wasted in Iraq, it's broken, there's nothing to win. 
it's a place where you either have to get out as quickly as possible or you have to find others that do the job for you. So I would say as a first uh, hypothesis, but I don't think it's too provocative, that there is no genuine idea um, of a positive engagement with the, with, the, with the region. It's more of containing and securing these five four goals. This also is underlined by something that was expressed under Obama. It's the idea of a leadership trap. Everybody is focused on what the U.S. is doing. If the U.S. is not taking the lead, um, nothing will happen or quite the opposite um, will happen. And I think this is something um, that is important when we talk about the, the retreat um, theory because I don't really see this happen either on the material base. So if we look at deployments of U.S. soldiers to the region, it has not declined, quite the opposite. In addition to the bases um, in the Gulf, we have military personnel in Jordan, in Syria, in Iraq. There is a discussion about a permanent presence in Syria, whether it's going to be implemented, but there is no idea that military disengagement is an option just because the region or conflict in the region is the way it is. And the lack or the inability of the Americans to actually find a pillar system that serves their interest. Institutions um, that were supported, especially under Obama, the Arab League was used as a, a communicative channel um, for U.S. policies, failed, UN, like global institutions, didn't really serve the interest. So there is a also a, a pessimism towards the capability of regional, uh, regional players. And I think that's very important because in the last two days we often talked about the idea of the U.S. being unreliable and not a good partner. We maybe should also change the perception and think if we look from Washington towards the region, is there anyone who is willing to put stability and regional security above their own interests? Um, if you look at the Gulf countries and their engagement in the fight against Daesh in Syria, they had no problem in abandoning the U.S. or the joint coalition mission and moving their forces to Yemen when it appeared more important to them. Defense spending, um, investment in, in, st in stabilization factors. It was mentioned that we have youth unemployment, climate issues. Regional players did not step up to their task to actually solve these very local issues by themselves, and I think that that feeds in into the de yeah, depressive outlook of the U.S. So coming to an end, um, if we have an incentive to withdrawal and, and pessimism towards the region, um, I think there is like maybe a chance for us to look and discuss options of withdrawal. What's really feasible, um, especially when we have a highly polarized um, system in the region. The first, I, but I kind of gave that up already, institutions. Will the U.S. invest in the rebuilding of institutions that it thought at some point would actually serve its interests? Gulf Corporation Council, Arab League. Is there a return to institutions? Donald Trump doesn't seem to be such a fan of institutions, but certainly um, he has an interest in getting out of the region um, when he sees it as costly. Will it be limited or comprehensive? Now we have a strong focus, especially after the collapse, what we maybe call the Arab Spring positive wave. Um, there's a clear focus only on security issue. And the only means of policy um, that could do anything or could change any equation is military. So arms sales have increased. Military engagement with the right guys is seen as like the only tool to achieve engagement, maybe with partners, in tackling um, the causes of these conflicts and instability. So far, I think we see like a limited focus of Donald Trump on these issues, but certainly cooperating with partners is um, could be an option. The last point, um, what kind of system would the U.S. leave behind if they go? Um, I see two options that we could discuss. The first is the Obama option or the Nixon option of the 70s, and that's the twin pillar Iran, Saudi Arabia, mediating some kind of a power-sharing agreement um, that would actually lead to a stabilization of the region that might not be um, that might not be so attainable in the moment, but would certainly be more promising than the second option, uh, which would be a new pillar system which is built on Saudi Arabia and Iran and con uh, on Saudi Arabia and Israel and would contain Iran. Whether this is would actually happen. I think that's what's suggested by the named countries um, 
as a good option to create a short-term stability, but it would certainly be challenged by, by Iran and uh, would demand like further negotiations. Um, I hope in the discussion we can also talk about Europe, but now I would leave it at that, and thank you. I think like um, there will be a Q&A session, but I want to like, you know, in your Q&As, if you, uh, when you come back to it, if you could elaborate a little bit more on this, um, the politics of having bases. A couple decades ago in the, in the region, we could have talked of only a handful of military bases, but right now we have over 28 bases in the region, and that's, and Central Command is one of the biggest. That tells about something, how, how the approach has, this is not something new that only happened maybe with Trump, but like how the, gradually the approach has been changing, and you never mentioned Turkey, so maybe you could talk about that a little bit later in the Q&A. Um, so um, now we're talking of the U.S. policy of having um, friendly, um, having closer relationship with friendly countries in the region. I want to come to Payam, uh, who is the director of the Iran Project at the Harvard Kennedy School Balfour Center. Payam, so how would you say that the U.S. foreign policy have evolved in the region? And more specifically, talking of friendly countries, the antithesis of, of that is clearly Iran in the region right now. It's no secret that the belligerent attitude of the administration towards Iran is not secret to anyone. What would you say the nature of American policy towards Iran right now, and how do you see, where will it lead to, what will be the trajectory, if you could elaborate? Sure. Thank you. Um, maybe just following the, the first conversations on, on whether the U.S. is uh, withdrawing from the region, you know, I'd say there is a clear pattern uh, since the Bush administration of retrenching from the Middle East, or at least revising or changing this transformative vision that the United States had for the Middle East, uh, including whether it be you know democratization, state building, nation building. Uh, in in that sense, uh, we see that retrenchment. Uh, a continuation uh, from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. So the Trump administration here is not an anomaly. It's a continuation of the re retrenchment policies of the, uh, the Obama administration. Uh, but what's important to keep in mind are uh, the ambiguities and the contradictions that this shift in U.S. policy can potentially create. Um, ambiguities for the role of uh, extra regional powers in the region, such as Russia, the EU, you know, what if the US uh, is, uh, is with uh, minimizing or becoming more pragmatic in its decision making vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, vis -vis the region, so what legitimate or proper role can extra regional powers, such as the EU or Russia, have? Um, here the US is ambiguous and vacillates at times on its positions. Um, and second, uh, U.S. Uh, relations with traditional allies, particularly Saudi Arabia and Turkey, where we do see those tensions and vacillations and ambiguities. But where the particular uh, strategic contradiction in U.S. foreign policy can be seen is on its Iran policy. Uh, and that's uh, the current issue uh, under the Trump administration. So a strategic contradiction under the Trump administration of how you can you know, retrench or be more pragmatic, cost-effective in your Middle East policy, but at the same time want to pull out of the Iran deal, want to ostracize Iran or create an anti-Iran coalition in the region to push back against Iran. But in order to first you know, explain why uh, the problems that may propose, uh, pose for the region, we have to understand why President Obama had a new shift in policy towards Iran. And that new shift in policy that President Obama had in Iran basically comes about uh, in reaction to failures of American policy in containing Iran and for undertaking regime change in Iran. So that type of pragmatism that set in into the U.S. Uh, uh, administration's thinking uh, led to, and it's reflective of President Obama's broader mindset of how to, how to negotiate with adversaries. You know, it's not the axis of evil approach. You actually sit down and you uh, speak with adversaries. You, you undertake diplomacy with the Iranian nuclear deal being a diplomatic uh, uh, outreach effort and solution uh, through a multilateral framework of basically, you know, uh, focusing first on Iran's 
uh, nuclear, nuclear program and the potential weaponization of the program to remove that, you know, the, the, the strategic challenge that the U.S. viewed coming from Iran and then uh, with the hopes of potentially building on that and then focusing on other uh, aspects of Iran's behavior, such as Iran's regional um, policy. But now with the questioning of um, the JCPOA under the Trump administration, we very much see a return to the previous American stance on Iran, which had never been successful from the first place. And I think it's very important to understand how many of the conflicts that we do see in the region, and the driver really does come back down to uh, the larger confrontation uh, between the United States and Iran. Uh, and here it's important that we have a proper understanding of Iranian strategy and the Iranian position in the Middle East. Unfortunately, at times we hear words such as, you know, the Persian Empire, we hear the words hegemon, uh, but that's really not, you know, the Iranian strategy. Iran uh, makes use of opportunities, not of its own creations. Uh, whether we see vacuums of power created uh, as, a, as, as a result of uh, U.S. wars with Iraq or Afghanistan, the erosion of Arab state systems, post-Arab Spring, civil wars, etc. Iran makes, you know, best use of these opportunities presented to it to create, to pursue both deterrent strategies uh, from uh, its own perceived security threats uh, and existential security threats, uh, going to the long-term you know, policy of regime change pursued by the United States, um, and counter-containment policies, uh, as well as support for asymmetrical, cheap asymmetrical uh, groups, uh, popular local armed movements that Iran supports who have been dispossessed uh, from the regional architecture. Uh, so, so in some ways, uh, in the context of an, ero an eroding Arab state system where this U.S.-Iran rivalry is taking shape, Iran has carved out its own security uh, framework uh, to, to, to ensure uh, uh, costs on, on what it sees as its own adversaries in case of potential attack on Iran. And, and the, the, the problem now that this becomes, we, we, we may enter in very risky and dangerous territory is that the nuclear deal was perhaps one of the main, I mean, one of the main benefits of the nuclear deal was potential confidence building measure um, of, of trying to establish some type of minimum trust or, or working relationship, uh, not just be between Iran and world powers, but particularly between Iran and the United States uh, where, as President Obama said, you know, Iran and Saudi have to share, share the region and learn how to share the region. Um, by undermining that agreement, um, even if, you know, Trump doesn't pull out May 12th, even if there is another uh, short-term extension, the very undermining of the agreement, questioning um, its importance, has shifted attitudes quite significantly in Tehran um, to... Um, really becoming pessimistic about the benefits of the nuclear deal and the benefits of engaging and reaching out to the United States that will harden the Iranian position. And then thinking about in terms of potential escalations moving into the, into the future, um, thinking about how Iran will double down on its um, regional foreign policy uh, and uh, we'll see potentially escalation in these various conflict zones throughout the region. And of course, um, in, a, in what one could say um, was what had brought the U.S. and Iran to the, to the table to negotiate from the very beginning, as in the, the United States had not been successful in that pushback policy and that containment strategy with Iran. Um, so we're going back to that same strategy in a context where Iran does have an upper hand, in a context where Iran is much more adept at brinkmanship than other regional countries, such as Saudi Arabia, and can bear the costs of that brinkmanship much more adeptly than other countries uh, in the region, which again makes it um, a very volatile and risky situation for all parties involved.
comments and maybe like um, in the Q&A with the questions obviously that would come, but you, you could maybe further sure. elaborate on them. The, the previous strategy belonged to the region where there was like authoritarian regimes and everything, but now we, we're going through a very different period and how this old strategy in the new dynamics will play. Um, now, talking of um, Iran and the U.S. relations and bringing another prominent actor into the table would be definitely Russia. Um, today we have Nikolai with us, who is the lecturer at the European University in St. Petersburg. Um, he's also a former associate at the Chatham House and also a former political attaché at the Russian Embassy in Tehran. Welcome, Nikolai. Um, everyone in the region, right, whenever we talk about the global actors, um, we're talking about a Russia moment. In, in, in the Middle East. And how would you um, describe the Russian involvement and policies and how they evolved in the region in the you know, recent past, and we can maybe even um, trace it to the post-Arab uprisings period, and what would you say are the main drivers of this change, and whether this change in US policy is actually affecting uh, this change in the Russian policy too? Thank you very much for <coughs> your questions, Zaina, definitely. Um, I would say it's indeed the, the timely question about uh, the Russian, the evolution of Russian approaches and where uh, the, the Russian presence in the Middle East actually goes. Um, the, uh, from my point of view, uh, Russia is still undergoing the certain evolution transformation of its uh, foreign policy towards the Middle East that started roughly about 2011-2012. And this transformation is not over yet. Um, so before 2012, we can find Russia being considering the uh, uh, region of the Middle East as something of the secondary importance. And indeed, uh, it uh, saw it rather playing ground for its games with the West, sometimes using the situation uh, in the Middle East as a bargaining chip, sometimes as a leverage on the Western behavior, but still largely ignoring the situation inside the region. The situation has changed in 2012, then suddenly we saw Russia jumping in the region. Yet still for the very first two years, uh, we could say that Moscow was just trying to intensify its traditional uh, way, uh, channels of communications with traditional players like Iran, uh, partly Egypt, uh, the real change uh, came only in 2015, then Moscow, for the first time since uh, the uh, uh, Soviet uh, invasion of Afghanistan, uh, brought in uh, its military forces in the region and uh, became deeply involved in the domestic dynamics uh, of, the, the, of Syria uh, and also trying to shape the, the situation in a number of other countries. Uh, interestingly, that uh, even after the beginning of the Russian military presence uh, in the region, it still uh, saw itself at the largely defensive positions, perceiving that it was uh, giving a response to those challenges that were formed in the region and around it to uh, Moscow national interests. Uh, the uh, uh, next step in the Russian presence, uh, in the evolution of the Russian presence in the Middle East, took place only probably in the late 2016, um, early 2017. Then Moscow finally got confident in its capacities to uh, deal with the Middle East and tried its um, potential to affect the situation in the region and to try to stay in the lead. This found its uh, reflection on the one hand in the attempts to bring the conflict settlement in Syria, on the other hand to affect the, the situation in uh, Libya as well. Uh, for now, I, I believe that Moscow has done a lot of investments uh, in the regional situation and the main task and the main priority of Russia will be try to capitalize uh, these investments and to try to uh, reach to, to get uh, certain income at the global level, at the level of its global strategy that goes beyond the region. And that's where we actually come to the main issue, uh, why uh, Moscow suddenly got that interested in, in intensifying its presence in the region and suddenly started to get uh, interested in dealing with the region itself. And here we have basically two groups of factors. So the first group is uh, external factors that were not directly related to 
uh, the uh, uh, relations between Russia and the Middle Eastern po uh, powers. Uh, these factors are largely related to Russian confrontation with the West, to the tense uh, relations between Moscow and, first of all, uh, Washington. Uh, Russia tried to use this situation again as a leverage to influence the, the, the U.S. stance on the Russian-U.S. relations uh, as uh, a way to make the, the Americans keep interest in, uh, uh, in, in avoiding complete isolation of Russia. It also, in certain cases, used its involvement in Libya, in uh, Syria as a revenge for what it saw as previous losses due to the, the, the U.S. involvement. But uh, these are not the only factors that were actually driving Russia this time uh, towards the Middle East. Uh, currently, we can say that there is a serious group of important internal factors that also um, plays their role in determining uh, Russian approaches. Uh, it is definitely the security dimension, or better to say, the perception of security threats that exist in the Middle East. Uh, we can here spend hours arguing whether the, the Russian, so-called Russian-speaking jihadists in Syria were really presenting uh, a threat to the national security of Russia, but that's what uh, the Russian leadership uh, honestly believed in when taking decision on the deployment of military uh, forces in the air base in Khmeimim. Um, secondly, it's uh, the uh, uh, economic drivers. Uh, sanctions imposed on Russia as well as difficult situation in the Russian economy, it compelled Moscow to um, use every opportunity to earn uh, additional uh, income in the budget. Plus the drop down in oil uh, prices, uh, it actually brought a very interesting phenomenon. For the first time, I guess, since 1991 and even since the, the existence of that pact, Russia got interested in uh, talking to, 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 to the OPEC members, and moreover, it had to adjust its foreign policy towards Syria in order to have a better dialogue uh, and Iran, and to, 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 to in order to, to have a better dialogue with Saudi Arabia that um, for quite a period was considered to be a Russian rival, not only from political points of view, but also from the economic points of view. Um, and finally, uh, there is another factor that's often ignored, it's the factor of the, 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 the domestic situation in Russia. The Russian military presence in Syria is often used also as a leverage to shape the public opinion in the country. And some Russian researchers believe that it played quite an important role in ensuring the high scores of Putin's support. Um, to, uh, and the existence of these two groups of factor, it creates a very interesting um, fundament for the development of future relations of Russian region, uh, of Russian Federation with the Middle East. On the one hand, we see uh, these relations still dependent on the paradigm of Russian-U.S. Uh, contacts. So that means that the sudden change, though I do not predict anyone anytime soon, may also affect the dynamics of Russian relations with the West and with its current partners or allies. But at the same time, the existence of the strong drivers uh, towards the region itself that are not attached or connected to, to uh, the uh, Russian-US dialogue, it also creates a certain guarantee that irrelatively to the change in the dynamics of uh, the Russian-US relations, Moscow remains interested in the uh, further dialogue with the region and its foreign policy will remain uh, quite nuanced to towards the Middle East. Uh, there is also definitely a question about the Russian priorities, but I guess I'm going a little bit over the time, and I'll be happy to discuss it during the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you, Boy. And I would just say one thing, you know, for you to get back at the Q&A. Um, you talked about economic sanctions and uh, how our economic um, drivers are affecting Russian policy, but the Russian heavy moment in the, right, in the region right now is very um, economically hard to bear, and that this new Russia that we are seeing in the region, how sustainable it is for Russia, how much longer Russia can go under sanctions and be this heavily and expensively involved in the region. Um, right now, and we discussed a little bit about the, um, and the, the, the traditional actors, but obviously the region is changing and there are a lot of new actors that are trying to enter in different capacities um, to discuss especially the um, Chinese moment in the region. Today we have Professor An Seng Ho with us, who is a professor of anthropology at the Duke University and also the director of Middle East Institute at the National University of Singapore. Welcome, Mr. Ho. Um, I have also a couple of starting questions for you. 
Um, what are the main drivers of the Chinese foreign policy in the MENA region? And also looking at um, traditional players who are positioning themselves in the region, how is China um, different in its approach um, to the region? And also, um, how, is, how is it competing against these traditional actors? Uh, thank you, Zainab. Thanks for your um, welcome to uh, come speak on this forum. Uh, my starting point for how to think about China is how to think about the Middle East. What I mean by this is to say that the Middle East is too small a place, a region, for Turks, Persians, Arabs, and Muslims who have always been across, all across, uh, past what is now the Middle East. So that's my starting point. So uh, my, my talk will uh, try to give you a larger sense of the trans region. And for that, I have to um, take a geographical, larger geographical view and a longer historical view, but we'll come back to contemporary issues. So the first thing I would say is that to think of a larger uh, Middle East, uh, what China offers is what in Arabic I would call tanfis. Tanfis is a sense of breathing out uh, air, having a larger room. Okay, so that is, I think, what uh, China can offer. Now, how do we think of this? Now, when the West went eastwards towards China 500 years ago, they had to go through this middle part of the world which is basically the Islamic world, whether Central Asia, North Africa, through India, Southeast Asia, and so on. This was the Islamic world. This was the middle part of the old world. When the West went through this middle part of the world, this is what we also call the history of colonialism. Now today, China is going in the opposite direction, towards the West, towards Africa. China has to go through this same middle part of the world. So the question, the starting question for me is, is China going to do it differently? How can China go through this world without repeating the problems of imperialism and war? Lenin had said that imperialism was the highest stage of capitalism, and China is the, I think, maybe number two, about to be number one largest capitalist uh, power in the world. China today is like Britain in the late 19th century, where Britain had excess finance, excess production capacity, uh, poured a lot of uh, money into infrastructure. Um, so China today, and also was the champion of free trade, if you think of these uh, four factors, China today is very much like Britain in the late 19th century. How is China going to do it differently? So if we think, take um, a geographical perspective, China's new uh, Silk Road Initiative, otherwise known as Belt and Road Initiative, number one, strikingly, it is going west. It is not going east. That is to say, it is not going into the Pacific to challenge American naval power. It is going west because by going west, you are not having a direct confrontation with the Americans. You will go through Central Asia. You will go through the Indian Ocean. Now, if we think of going west, and if we think of where China is, if you think Take a line down the East China coast. You have basically an American line just off the East China coast. You have uh, Japan, Taiwan, the Philippines, down to Southeast Asia. Uh, an American line very close to the South China coast. So there is a long-term Chinese strategy to push the American line out to create a sort of Chinese Monroe uh, doctrine. So the first uh, place China goes to in this frame is Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is a place where China has been involved in uh, creating a global supply chain. Southeast Asians have been part of a global supply chain with China as a center of gravity for over 30 years. And when you have this production, shared production base exporting to the world, you have infrastructure projects, you have communications, and so it is not a huge step for the Southeast Asians to sign on to the Belt and Road Initiative. And so we see in China, China has moved on, in fact, to have a political and indeed military strategy in the South China Sea to create, I would say, something like a Monroe Doctrine. So in Southeast Asia, the closest neighbor, you see the multi-dimensional, uh, the creation of multi-dimensional power. And that multidimensional power, I would say, is challenging the U.S. 
And uh, I would say maybe 80% of Southeast Asia has gone over to the Chinese side. So in Southeast Asia, you had ASEAN, a multilateral thing. China has been picking them off one by one on a bilateral basis. And so this is, I think, uh, the sort of full model developing of Chinese expansion. Now, when China goes further out, it becomes thinner. China does not have, at least within the next 50 years, this ambition of a multilateral power further out. Further out, China goes, number one, with economics. Maybe 50 years later, it'll do military, but first with economics. And in this uh, view, I would say two things. One is China's view is long-term and deliberate and geographical. Number two, it is also, at the same time, opportunistic in execution. I would take Angola as a prime example. Angola, when it suffered civil war, the uh, Western oil majors pulled out, China went in. So China went in, it was a low-cost, um, low cost, low political and low economic cost venture, and China walked out with its largest oil supplier from Africa, from Angola. So if you take this Angola model, you look at Hambantota port, Gwadar port, uh, Dukum port in Oman, the port of Piraeus in Greek, China is going in on a very low-cost, opportunistic basis. These are places which are very cheap to enter now. Nobody wants it. There's no objection from the US. China is going in on this basis, low-cost economically and politically. Now, if we think of this low-cost uh, approach, then it makes sense for the Silk, for, in terms of the Silk Road, where you are going uh, territorially through Central Asia and in a maritime sense through the Indian Ocean. Now, this is where we come to the Middle East. China will go into the mid Middle East on a low-cost basis. China will go into the Middle East on a no-objections basis from the US. China does not want to be caught in the Middle Eastern swamp or desert. Um, now, with respect to the Middle East, uh, the Middle East is not the big prize for China. The big prize for China is the United States. China wants to be the equal of the United States. China will think of the Middle East in terms of its relation to the United States. So, for, for example, energy is a big deal for China. Gas from Qatar, oil from the Middle East is a big deal. But China will increasingly buy oil and gas from the United States. This will help China with its trade imbalance with the United States. This will help China uh, stabilize its relations with the United States. Number one, the corollary of that is that China will not play the Middle East like a football, which, uh, as we've heard from my colleague, uh, Russia is doing. China, I don't think, will instrumentalize the Middle East. In fact, China would rather be able to play the role of a partner of the United States in tamping down problems in the Middle East. So from this point of view, uh, China's entry into the Middle East would be very different from a Russian, from Amer an American uh, position, which has been flip-flopping uh, and trying to gain leverage there for global politics. So I think that is a key difference uh, with China. Now, I do not think the Middle Eastern countries uh, have developed a framework for thinking about or for engaging China. There is no Middle Eastern bank for um, development and reconstruction, unlike other regions. So I think we are not there yet in terms of, let's say, intellectual capacity for how to think about China's entry. So I will uh, suggest, finally, how do we in the Middle East think of China's entry within this broad historical and geographical framework uh, I've sketched out for you. Um, the simplest way to put it is the problem we've been talking about the past two days centers around Syria. Syria is a place where all the major Middle Eastern countries are facing off each other. They are looking inwards to Syria. And this to me is a closed box. It's going to be endless. Now, if we think of a different Middle East, which I opened with, a Middle East on a broad geographical frame, if you think of the various players, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, not looking inwards towards Syria, but looking outwards, with their backs facing each other 
in the Syrian direction and looking out in other directions. If we think of it um, in this manner, and we think of what I think is an emerging, uh, I won't call it a fault line, but an emerging trend in the politics of the region, uh, my colleague Sirkan uh, Yolajan mentioned this at the plenary this morning. We do see a northern tier of Iran, Turkey, Russia getting together. And I don't mean a conspiracy. I mean uh, great powers, which were great empires, learning to cooperate, to solve problems in Astana, learning to live with each other again. They have lived with each other for uh, centuries, they are learning to deal with each other in this contemporary context. So you have the northern tier of these, I would say, West Asian powers. I would not call them Middle Eastern, I would call them West Asian. And you have a, what I call a southern tier of Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, Egypt, I would also throw in uh, Ethiopia. Um, these are a southern tier. These are, you would say, um, involved in the maritime part of the Chinese Silk Road. These uh, look down towards the Indian Ocean, east towards South Asia, west, towards, west and south towards uh, Africa. Um, so that's another cut. So I think um, there is a long-term um, geostrategic possibility which aligns along the current fault lines in the Middle East and if the players in the Middle East start to look outwards and resume their old geographical partnerships, so for the Arabians towards the Indian Ocean, towards East Africa, towards uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, for the Turks, Iranians, and so on, up into the um, territorial region, Central Asia to Europe, I think that provides a new alignment for the Middle East countries, which aligns with uh, what I think China is trying to do coming from the East. Now, I know that all the Middle Eastern countries are very US-oriented. The Gulf countries, when they have trouble with, with each other, each one spends $100 billion on arms in, in the US. Uh, my friends in the US are making good money as lobbyists for all sides. Uh, so I'll, I will end there to say that um, 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 there is a long-term chance for the Middle East countries if they look outwards and revert back to their own geographical orientations. Thank you. Thank you. I think the key moment was the Middle East was West Asian countries, right? Like that, that, that was a nice um, change of expression. Um, now, to continuing with the team of um, China getting involved in the region, I want to turn to Professor Goth Lepere. Um, he is the International Relations Professor at the University of Pretoria. Uh, he's also the Senior Associate at the Mapungabe Institute for Strategic uh, Reflection in Johannesburg. Um, Professor Goth, I, want, I know that you have been working um, seriously um, on the Chinese involvement in the Africa uh, and African nations. And now looking at the Chinese pol policy in Africa, how would you say that these differ from how China gets involved in, in the MENA region? And what would you say that, uh, how, looking at what China did in Africa, again, how can you say that like, the China can offer um, to the region in terms of regional security transformation? Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity. I would say that the broad paradigm is very similar. And I would also, uh, borrowing from Professor Ho, I like to start with the Belt and Road Initiative as sort of the grand ambition of uh, Xi Jinping to provide these land and sea connectivities of which uh, the Middle East as well as the eastern uh, part of the Mediterranean as well as the Persian Gulf is a very integral part. So in a sense, you know, what the calculus that China uses in Africa uh, strategically, financially, uh, as well as conceptually is very similar to the approach that it is using in the Middle East. And uh, that, is, that is the framework, I think, that it intends to use. What is also interesting is that China's growing interest in the Middle East represents something of a rebalancing from Washington 
uh, to Beijing, so we can, in a sense, talk about a Middle East pivot uh, to Asia. Now, economic cooperation between China and the Middle East, as with Africa, is very important. It is increasing, uh, particularly with regard to China's energy requirements, particularly with regard to securing its energy future. But the point to make here is that China has maintained a very low profile uh, foreign policy posture towards conflict zones in the region based on its non-interference principle. This essentially has been the leitmotif of its bilateral engagements with uh, countries in Africa, and I think it, it intends to replicate that within the Middle East situation. As with Africa, there's a primacy and an emphasis on economic issues over political and security issues and concerns. But China, I think, is increasingly starting to grapple with the conundrum of how it can assist with promoting political sp stability in the region as a key to its role in advancing and uh, uh, promoting economic growth and cooperation. Uh, in this regard, it's particularly interesting that in January 2016, uh, China released its Arab policy paper. And that Arab policy paper has very similar uh, components as its China-Africa paper, which was released in 2006. The emphasis and the underpinning philosophy is pragmatic cooperation, which is based on mutual benefit, win-win gains, and so on, with Arab countries, uh, in essence, more or less repeating the broad sort of template that defines China's engagement with developing countries, whether in this region, Africa, uh, or Latin America. Now, as China's global outreach, and I think China is becoming seized with this, uh, insofar as there is increasing tension between its economic engagements and global instability, particularly with regard to terrorism, there is now in the Chinese discourse an increasing uh, focus on political issues, which I think is sort of inevitable. So in this regard, China could promote a kind of dialogue forum, which already exists, by the way, uh, in the African Union, namely uh, the African Peace and Security Architect Architecture a Partners Forum, which consists of the African Union, uh, the European Union, the BRICS countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and, and South Africa, um, as well as the EU. And this is based, I think, on three compelling logics. Sort of adds some footnotes to what has been said here. The first is that the US no longer enjoys a monopoly on decisions in the region on the big systemic questions of war and peace. In other words, uh, the Pax Americana uh, is no longer the dominant paradigm as it once was. The second is that Russia's involvement is now indispensable, in my view, to managing and resolving the crisis in the, in the Middle East, and Russia very much wants to be seen as a responsible global actor. And the third is that even though the Euro European Union has been, has been called an invisible superpower, uh, it still plays an important role in terms of its economic relations, in terms of its humanitarian uh, support, as well as its institutional partnerships. So in conclusion, uh, I would like to suggest that China's dialogue could be set, centered around agenda setting uh, uh, with regard to four critical themes in the Middle East region. The first concerns borders, migration, and mobility. The second relates to transnational threats. Uh, the third is control of weapons of mass destruction and disarmament. And then finally, uh, the trends and challenges that uh, emerge from the energy market. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Galt. Um, now um, I'm coming to my uh, final panelist, Ranch um, Latin, to look at all these changes that are happening in the region in terms of um, new actors and other uh, traditional global players. And 
how, like, what do you see when you look from the region? So Ranj, who is also an uh, associate at the Oxford Research Group and a visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. Um, Ranj, now looking from the region with an acute eye, and what do you see in terms of the changing roles of and the policies of uh, the global um, players in the region, and how is it perceived in general uh, by the region? And also you could tell us a little bit more about the new dynamics um, that the traditional actors have and how does that affect the regional um, engagement with new players. Zainab, and thank you for having me back here at Al Sharq Forum. Uh, I think really over the past five or six years, the region has, to, to put it generally, looked for alternatives. Uh, certainly, as Magdalena pointed out, the U.S. is not necessarily uh, in decline in the region. It still has that significant presence and that can translate into significant power and uh, influence. But politically, I think the approach, the engagement from the West, from the U.S. has been uh, abysmal, has been awful. Uh, and we see the consequences of that uh, in Syria, for example. We see the consequences uh, certainly uh, in Iraq, where much of the focus has been one of counterterrorism, uh, rather than some kind of uh, broader vision and strategy for these countries. And of course, bearing in mind that much of the problems that exist do emanate, uh, if we were to go back to the past 10, 15 years, to the Iraq war, which really set into motion much of the uh, the trends, let's say, that we have uh, unfolding and, and, and the destabilizing impact that it all had. And really, I think that's the, that's the central theme that I think should be, uh, uh, that, that, I, that I think we, we need to focus on, um, how engagements can produce long-term costs. We, we do think of Russia, China as potential alternatives. Uh, certainly, they've become much more assertive. Uh, in Russia, I see a reawakened actor rather than a new actor. In China, certainly uh, a new actor. But really, I think the region still is poorly informed as to how these countries operate, um, where they lie in, in, in terms of their values, let's say, and their ideals. Because the Middle East has uh, faced something of a contradiction where there is deep suspicion of Western involvement for historical reasons. Uh, U.S. involvement, but at the same time, it has embraced the ideals of, uh, of, of open politics, of reform, of fundamental freedoms, of democracy, uh, the, the key demands that underpin the Arab Spring uh, uprisings. Uh, but again, of course, it doesn't necessarily want all that to be imposed uh, and enforced by the U.S., quite frankly, because the record is poor. Uh, the West has failed dramatically in that regard, where it certainly had the framework and the vision, it's had all the soft power elements that, makes, that has made it uh, an ideal uh, global power. But when it comes to implementation, uh, when it comes to, again, the short-term interests, bearing in mind the traditional support it has had for authoritarian regimes, despots, again, a critical reason why the region uh, is in the situation it is today, it's, it's, it's lacked uh, a, an ideal uh, uh, package uh, where it can have the best of both worlds. Uh, and unfortunately, I think the region now finds itself in a position where it has to th start thinking for itself. Now, in my opinion, in the longer run, that can be a healthy, good thing. Uh, and even something like uh, the, the Gulf crisis, for example, that's established something of, a, uh, of, of competing different blocks uh, the Turkey-Qatari relationship uh, isn't yet a fully crystallized block, but it's a strategic alliance which provides, provides a balance, let's say, with everything else that you have in the region. Uh, it can potentially produce an equilibrium, uh, which is critical for stability, a sensitive balance of power that can ensure there isn't one particular regional hegemon that can ensure that uh, one country or a set of countries aren't imposing uh, their will imposing themselves on the region. Uh, and again, so so that in, in the longer run, that certainly, I think, will be healthy and is crucial. Uh, but the question is, at what cost? Um, what costs have to be paid uh, before we get to that level? Syria, I think, will continue to shape the geopolitics of the region. Uh, firstly, because it's established in, uh, in Iran, 
in the Iran-Russia, let's say, alliance, in the Iran-Russia-Assad, one would say maybe even Baghdad alliance, a potential regional hegemon in the making. Um, I, I agree with my colleague on the panel that that might not be uh, a, a specific target uh, of, of Iran, but it certainly has been a, a byproduct or a consequence uh, of the way things have unfolded in the region. And if you look at the scholarship, the literature, uh, whether it applies to the Middle East or elsewhere, when that happens, that creates a lot of uncertainty. And we see now how the region, the Arab world in particular, has become a lot more assertive in its rhetoric, its narrative, in its purchasing of weapons, uh, in its, uh, uh, its, its uh, doubling down of efforts in other theaters of conflict to undermine its rivals at the opposite end of the, of the spectrum. Uh, the West is in decline because the international rules-based order itself uh, is in decline. But is this simply a, a blip, a, simply a short-term decline, or is this something that will continue? Uh, I think until these other so-called new actors embrace the rules-based international order, the institutions that have evolved, emerged, have become critical to the international system since the end of the Second World War, the US and the West, in quotation marks, will continue to be the dominant actor. Uh, because again, Russia certainly has invested heavily, it certainly has an economic strategy, uh, but I don't see a vision. Uh, I see it more as a disruptor, uh, a country that wants to simply disrupt the US presence in the region, but, and that's about it. China has a vision, it has a strategy, it's ambitious, uh, but again, is that simply it? Uh, if you speak to people in the region, and I'm sure this can apply to anywhere here in Turkey as well, uh, there is still a limited understanding of China. Uh, and that's why I'm still skeptical that these countries can really, truly replace uh, the West uh, as an alternative. And really, do they want to stick around? The US, the West, whether it's Europe, for example, has invested heavily in things like education, in things like civil society, in technology, in innovation. Uh, and really, while there might be problems in Washington, D.C., uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, with the rise of populist far-right groups, there is still that, let's say, parallel network of institutions, of organizations that still promote the ideals, the values that have been owned and championed by the West, by the U.S. Uh, as well. And at the same time, I think in Russia and China, you still have rather fragile countries at home. Uh, they're policies still are undertaken with one eye certainly on their problems at home, whether it's the potential for a revolution, whether it's uh, events unfolding in the Korean, Pense Korean Peninsula, uh, whether it's still ongoing Russian suspicions uh, of the US, of the West. Uh, so really, I don't think they have that capacity even to you know, take their eye of, that, of those problems they have at home to truly and fully invest in the Middle East. And that should send alarm bells uh, in the region, uh, because, quite frankly, Russia and China will, if things get too rough, if, if things get too costly, pack up and go home. We haven't really spoken enough, I think, on the strings and the conditions that China att attaches to its investments. They're still rather opaque. Um, they still uh, could potentially and probably are emboldening, reinforcing the despots, the corrupt elites, uh, the uh, the, the components, the, the, the ingredients that essentially provide an environment that is conducive to further instability, to uh, volatility. Uh, and, th and things will get worse, again, because it's one of perception, I think. Uh, and really, if we're talking about the region, I always say, let's talk about Turkey and Iran. Uh, there's only really two countries in the region that have uh, the capacity um, that for reasons of history, um, that for reasons of uh, ambition even, are capable of reimposing something of, of, of an order in the region, uh, establishing the rules, the constraints, the limits, the conditions uh, that can ensure half a million people aren't killed uh, in Syria. But that will require more interventionist, more outward-looking uh, foreign policies, uh, particularly on the part of a, uh, of a power, a regional power like Turkey. Coming back to the perception uh, of Iran and why I think think things will get worse. Uh, the growing perception of Iran as a regional hegemon simply will be unacceptable uh, to the region at large, but also to, uh, to the Americans, which are clearly positioning themselves for a, for a confrontation 
with, with Iran. And it really comes down to how these countries envision their, their, their status, but also whether they want to engage in the business of rebuilding states, refashioning societies. Uh, the, the Syria conflict, again, is no longer about the Syrian people, unfortunately. Uh, it really is or has become a battle for regional supremacy, uh, a battle for, the dom for dominance over the Middle East uh, itself. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. And I want to thank all my panelists. That <clears throat> I think I was the luckiest moderator today. And everyone st stuck to their times without me even reminding. So now I want to um, open up the uh, panel for um, questions, open the floor for questions. And we have uh, mics at the corner. If you raise your hands, we'll take one or two, three, couple questions at a time. And you know, when you take the mic, please introduce yourselves. Um, and let's keep the questions in the succinct manner as our panelists. Uh, Adel Hamazia, uh, Oxford and SOAS. Thanks very much for wonderful presentations. Uh, I took a lot from every single one. Um, I, have a cup, I have one question that could be answered by anybody and one question for my colleague from Duke. Uh, the first question on Russia, um, I'd be interested to hear thoughts on, um, it was alluded to very briefly at the end, uh, post-war reconstruction, spoils of war, um, you mentioned this mature ability to compartmentalize economics and politics between Saudi and uh, Russia uh, through, through Vienna or through the OPEC uh, system. And of course, Turkey and Iran have done that uh, despite being at uh, opposite sides of uh, things when it comes to Syria. If you could say a little bit about uh, companies, Russian companies, Turkish companies, Iranian companies, uh, is the competition likely to lead to collision later on despite the maturity at this current uh, stage? Um, I'd also be interested to hear uh, on the China side of things. Um, of course, you mentioned the, the low-cost approach to uh, commercial grabs from Thessaloniki to Gwadar, uh, and of course, uh, one elephant would have been the role of the Chinese-Indian competition uh, in the region. Uh, Shah Bahar comes to mind. Um, following the last couple of like the the issue or incident uh, a couple of days ago in Djibouti, between this laser incident between the Chinese and the U.S. With the Chinese Middle East envoy in Syria, with the experience that the Chinese had in Libya, with the Chinese drone factory in Saudi Arabia, with the Chinese base in uh, Djibouti, with increasing growing economic interest, $63 billion loaned between Exim Bank from between 2000 and 2015, China to Africa versus the US $1.7 billion. Um, so when, we, when, you, when you keep all of that in mind, are we likely to see a growing Chinese military presence in the Middle East and Africa naturally to um, cordon one's investments and one's assets. Thanks very much. Any other questions that we should take right now? Yeah, over there. Thank you very much. My question is for Professor Ho. Uh, Professor Ho, thank you very much for your uh, explanatory and enlightening speech. Uh, Especially, it was a very sarcastic uh, point of view. Point of view uh, that you you said that China will not enter Syria uh, to play uh, football like Russia, and uh, we see that uh, in competition uh, to rebu rebuilding and over serious reconstruction. Uh, we, we see that China is likely the winner. So what kind of, uh, what kind of opportunity uh, does China see to rebuilding this war-torn country? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if there's a question again, we should take one more. Yeah. Um, my question will be for Christina about the U.S interests in the uh, the region. Do you think that U.S. changed the, the policy of promoting democracy because it could bring Islamic regime and it could be a security problem for Israel? Thank you. Um, let's, let's keep it at this and then let's do one round of answers and then we'll get another round of questions. Uh, let's start with the, the Russia question on construction and competition between the Russian, Turkish and Iranian companies. Who wants, because I think it was an address to anyone, right, Adel? So like, who wants to take on that question, the first question? Um, Nicole. Uh, 
Well, I guess it's a high time to speak about Russian interests and <laughs> their understanding. Um, I completely disagree that it's just all about confronting the U.S. <coughs> uh, I would say Russia doesn't have a clear articulated strategy, but it has certain principles in terms of uh, involvement and pre presence in the region. And uh, it does confront in the U.S. in those areas where it's necessary for its national interest, but um, it's not about just the U.S.-Russia dialogue when it comes, for instance, to the dialogue with the OPEC or um, in other areas. Uh, Russia is extremely pragmatic. That's what we should uh, keep in mind when we're assessing Moscow's uh, approaches to the region. It doesn't see it tasks in the Middle East, uh, including in Syria, as the uh, paternalistic task when you need to reconstruct, rebuild the, soil, so, so the civil society or reconstruct the social relations. It's uh, additional risks, uh, extremely f high financial burdens and the Russian financial capacities are limited. Uh, so, from this point of view, um, I would say that um, Moscow is not ready to take the reconstruction of Syria on its own and is much more interested in uh, getting involved in those areas that can bring profit to its companies or uh, oil and gas, definitely. Uh, and that's where we can recall the, the rumors about Europolis company or Soyuz Stroy Transgas previously that basically made a certain steps towards the, the, the security, the, the control of the oil and gas sector of uh, Syria in future. Um, or there is also another option for the Russian companies, um, it is to get paid by other members of the international community for the reconstruction. So that, that's what they, they are trying to make, for instance, in terms of the reconstruction of Iraq and recent uh, Oh, well, it, it became clear from, from the recent meeting on the, on the donors of uh, Iraq reconstruction that took, I guess, several months ago. Um, took place several months ago. Um, but um, that's where probably one of the main sources for divergence between at least Russia and Iran is. Because I guess uh, to a large extent the, the Iranians, they stick to the same idea that they invested a lot in Assad, in saving Assad regime, and they wanted to have their part of, of the... Um, uh, Syrian economy or what was left from the Syrian economy. Uh, quite recently, the Russian media and the international media reported about, for instance, the, the, uh, the fact that Moscow managed to uh, agree on uh, receiving the control of certain mines that were pre previously promised to Iran. And I guess that sets certain mm, uh, pattern for, for the future, for the post-conflict period, that's much more dangerous for the relations between these three that were compelled to become partners in this conflict. Um, that uh, the main sources of divergence may emerge exactly uh, when the question comes how to divide what remains from Syria. Um, next question to uh, Mr. Ho on China India rivalry and also that Chinese investment, how huge it is and what kind of repercussions it's going to bring to the region. And then also you had the China building question. Right, uh, I'll take it in uh, two 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 parts. One is the question of will China militarize to protect its uh, assets? Um, if you look at uh, Sri Lanka, the uh, Sri Lankan government uh, defeated the Tamil separatists after, I don't know, more than a 20, more than a quarter century, essentially with uh, Chinese help with arms. I think that's uh, one thing which broke the camel's back. Now, in return for this, uh, China got uh, Hambantota port and so on. So, so this when you supply arms, there is a military component, but it was done in an economic way. And in return for this, basically, um, China got the Hambantota port. And um, it was not without difficulty because the uh, government which came in after Rajat Paksa was initially against the deal Rajat Paksa made with China and then it came around. Um, but the whole deal was made on a state-to-state -state basis. Okay, so that's bilateral, state-to-state, -state, uh, not so difficult. Now, when you come to Djibouti and East Africa, it becomes more difficult. I think uh, China entry into Djibouti has partly been a result of the Djibouti leaders' very deft ability to host many different parties, the French, the Americans, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, Qatar, China, and so on. So, so Abu, uh, Djibouti has been very uh, fleet-footed in uh, doing, playing this uh, game. Now, 
One problem is that the Gulf rivalries have now expanded to East Africa, essentially, and the Horn of Africa. So Djibouti is finding itself caught, um, having to choose sides. It recently kicked out the UAE, and Somalia also recently kicked out UAE. You can um, extend this game to the Horn of Africa, East Africa. So things are getting uh, tight there, and I think that reflects exactly the sort of thing China does not want to get involved in. So China currently is becoming, finding a bit of a problem there. But I would also say that China has had a great success in that region in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, China has built um, a lot of um, factories, industrial zone, this light industry, this sort of thing. And Ethiopia is a huge country, population-wise. Hmm? It was landlocked until China now has built a uh, a new uh, rail railroad all the way down into uh, Djibouti. So China is help. So so it, it is playing this role of uh, complementary partner. Uh, so that is uh, the role China is most comfortable playing with. On the Djibouti side, on getting caught, it is not so comfortable. I think at this point, China does not have the um, naval power to um, assert to protect assets. China has one second-hand aircraft carrier from Ukraine, I believe. So it is about 500 years out of practice as a naval power. So it's not going to do that uh, at this point. Uh, with respect to Syria, uh, I would say that, well, Syrian war is not over, but uh, roughly we can say that the victors so far, Iran, Russia, do not have money to put into Syria. The losers, Saudi, the USA, will not want to put money into Syria. That leaves the Chinese as, I think, one party which has money to put in. Um, as I've said, it does not want to jump into a swamp. But let me um, um, say a bit more about China. China is not one player. China is multiple players. There are individuals uh, going out to all corners of the world trying to make a living, trying to improve their uh, economic circumstances. There are individuals going out. They sometimes even marry locals. There are um, city governments going out doing deals. There are individual companies going out. There are then national-level banks going out, national-level construction companies going out. And I would say the state coming in is actually the last actor. So you need this kind of disaggregated view of the Chinese in order to think of how they will come in. And this will be a big issue for the rest of the world. Uh, it's not that different from the US. The US is many parties. How do you think of the US? Are they coordinated? Are they not? That is a big issue for how to think about China. They are not always coordinated. So that is something which I think we will all have to learn in order to deal with the Chinese. Thank you. And now, Magda. Uh, that also gives me the uh, opportunity to challenge the end of transformation views because I think democracy promotion in the way of transforming and seeing like uh, having a revolutionary outlook towards the region will s is still a part of, of US outlook. Um, if you hear Donald Trump, you say he doesn't have a problem smoothing with dictators, but if you follow his tweets on the protest in Iran, he still has this idea that regime change, call it uh, democratization, call it, uh, call it transformation. But I think, and then, it turning to Israel, um, and we can see that in the Hamas case, and we can, saw, we can see it in Egypt, um, I think that was your question, whether like a democracy that could go in the wrong direction um, could negatively impact status quo powers in the region. Um, I think when, when it's that I mentioned before, like the core security interests, um, there is at the same time parallel, maybe stronger, an imperative to put the brakes. Um, and, I mean, you asked before about military bases. The problems, or the curse of military bases is that it, it enforces a commitment to the status quo of, of the political system you're in, right? You have to have a sofa, you have to have infrastructure, so you're kind of entrenched in the survival of the regime of the state where you have your military base. Um, and I think this is um, the problem um, views as same as the European Union on 
in which pace, in which sequence can we have a transformation that we actually think is something good and can be supportive, but at the same time secure the survival um, and security of our own security goals. Um, and I think the difference is that while, whereas Obama and some Europeans thought this could be, this necessary process could be speed up um, and the fall wouldn't be so terrible, you had uh, among your allies a lot of hardcore status quo forces like Israel, like Saudi, um, who thought we are not willing to take the risk because we're here. So I think you did not overcome, nobody managed to overcome, and I think Donald Trump will also not do it, um, to to overcome the dilemma or the trade-off between democracy and, um, and security when they're confronted or displayed by local allies as a confrontation and necessary decision that has to be made. Um, but just maybe one point on the, oof, sorry, um, on this question of what is the, why, what's the disappointment with the, um, with the US? Because actually I think the US policy has been a source of survival um, for dictatorships in the region. And that tells us a lot about how the states, I'm sorry, that's a cyber, that time, hybrid war. Um, no, it shows like a lot of how these regimes in the region actually use both the presence of old powers and the arrival of new powers to distract power resources for domestic. So, arms sales, military support, economic support that focuses on the security apparatus actually prevents the transformation. I don't really see the, the local actors changing their approach, they're just using to bring others in to play the, to play the same game. Last question huh, to the panel. Um, because I don't really see from the actors that were mentioned that there is really a wish for a disruption of US presence. Not sure on if this is a wish on Iran, if Russia wants to do it, if China wants to do it. Does anyone actually want to think about how, or if you want to either use, sorry, either use the security umbrella they're providing to make business, or want to more shift their policies into a direction that's better for you. But I don't see it in the interest of any actors that we talked about to kick the Americans out when, if they do the job um, by bringing like the hard power in and then under the radar the Indians and Chinese can come in and make business. Um, let's take a couple more questions, but I want the panel to ref you know, respond to Magdalena. Let's take a couple more questions and let's start with then Magdalena's question. Yeah, or I'll come back over there. Uh, yes, yes, sure. Okay, my question is addressed to uh, my Iranian friend, actually American, yes, <laughs> Payam. Um, President uh, Trump is trying to withdraw from the Iranian nuclear treaty and is, I mean, accusing the U.S. administration of uh, signing that, Obama administration actually, of signing that treaty that is very terrible and so on. And uh, But just a simple question I just want to ask you if you are aware of the details of the nuclear treaty. Um, what he wants to be changed in that treaty, what, what are the obligations he wants to impose on Iran, and um, what are deficiencies of that treaty that he just uh, such in it desperately is trying to liquidate that treaty? Thank you, and there's another gentleman on the back. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Jalal Khashib. I'm from Algeria, Department of Asian Studies and International Relations. Uh, my thesis is about China. <laughs> That's why I would like to uh, address a question to Professor Hu. Uh, when you describe China, you, you, you describe it like a peaceful power, but uh, a peaceful power who looking for uh, economic uh, cooperation with MENA region and uh, uh, and investment, but I think that you are talking about the contemporary China. Uh, what about China in the future? China after 15 or 20 years? China, I think, will transfer 
uh, its economic wealth to uh, military uh, military assets. And if you want, if you would like to believe me, just uh, look into South China th uh, Sea region. China now uh, trying to create uh, uh, islands there, artificial islands there, and try to create uh, an alliance uh, to push out the US pres USA prisons uh, out. And now China could, uh, could get an influence in MENA region through Iran, I think, or through Algeria in North Africa. So what about China in the future? This is my question. Um, thank you. Um, one more question. Uh, Yuri? Uh, I have a question for Nikolai and Payam. Um, I was wondering if you could um, elaborate a little bit on, um, on, on, on the question of where the, do you think the Russia-Iran relationship is going to go, looking beyond Syria, down a few years down the line, if, you, you know, if we sort of put Syria aside and look at other factors that might shape the relationship in the future. Thanks. Thank you. Any more questions? I think Adel wants to add something. Yeah. Uh, just a mini addendum. Um, in terms of scenarios uh, for, for the region and some of the alliances, it would be great to hear, but uh, the follow-on from that and to follow on from the first question would be um, if the JCPOA is nullified, multilateral, whatever, but of course secondary sanctions play a massive role in the European side of uh, thinking. Um, can we see an Iran in Shanghai Cooperation Council in the future? And uh, anything on the role of AIIB and BRI as a, a, a security, um, uh, a securitizing factor in the region? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have a quite a bit of questions um, lined up. Uh, I want the panel to first address uh, Magdalena's question. Who wants to take on? Should, should we come to you, Payam? I can start. Yeah. So does Iran want the U.S. to leave the region? Um, formally, that's what it says. But I think that Iran can live with the U.S. in the region. But it really comes back to its security concern of whether the U.S. is after regime change or not, primarily. And second is Iran's concern for being able to create uh, indigenous, indigenous solutions or frameworks for security arrangements. Now, that doesn't mean that the U.S. necessarily can't be a part of that, but it wants a more uh, independent, how should I say, independent states to get to that. And in part, I think that's a reaction to uh, what Iran sees as non-independent Arab states that are following the U.S. line rather than taking an independent position. For example, Iran doesn't see the Saudi, Saudi Arabia as independent. Um, I mean, whether that's correct or not is, a, is, a, is another issue. But I think that comes back to, to your, your earlier point of, you know, um, when you said the U.S. still has some elements of a transformative vision with regards um, to the support for the Iranian protesters. But I think that, I think that should be seen separately um, in terms of U.S. going back to reverting to that policy of regime change on Iran. So Iran's different. So there is that transformative vision for Iran because of the policy of regime change versus the rest of the Middle East or Arab world, where even on Syria uh, with Bashar Assad that, you know, is an Iranian ally, we, we hear statements by Trump saying, you know, we, we should just pull out, Syria has nothing to do with us, um, which, you know, which Iran would like, for example, but it's going back to that regime change policy that, that is like the ex existential heart of Iran's security conundrum. And Zainab, you had initially asked me a question can the old strategy of pushback against Iran that had failed, how will that work in the new context of the Middle East? And I think that's where the contradiction in U.S. policy is, and one that we don't have a clear U.S. strategic vision for what it wants with Iran or how it's going to get to the pushback uh, with Iran in the region. But second, we have a region that's much more fragmented, much more eroded than any time before. So if there's going to be pushback, that pushback's going to be much weaker Previously, when you actually had stronger Arab states and a stronger regional framework of minimizing, you know, the, the areas or opportunities that Iran could, could expand upon. And, I mean, the other area, I mean, if Saudi Arabia, its military spending is five times the amount of Iran's. And yet, you know, from the Iranian perspective, 
uh, Saudis losing to the, one of the poorest countries in the world, Yemen. I mean, what type of credibility signal does that send in terms of Saudi strength? Um, so to think of the, the possibility or uh, the potential for any type of pushback that can come, I mean, that's where the contradiction, I think, really is highlighted of, of, of what to do with Iran if we undermine and destroy those very um, means that we've created for getting to a negotiated or diplomatic solution with Iran or thinking about how to discuss and negotiate with Iran over uh, its, its, its role and behavior in the Middle East. The question from the gentleman here, um, what does Trump want to change, President Trump want to change with the JCPOA? So there are several criticisms that are, are, are posed against the JCPOA. One is the issue of sunset clauses, that after 10 to 15 years, Iran gets to, for example, uh, expand its uranium enrichment program, uh, that Iran's regional behavior is not part of the deal, Iran's missile capabilities are not part of the deal, uh, there's not a strong enough mechanism for uh, the, the monitoring or visitation of military sites in Iran to check for clandestine materials. Uh, but the, the issue is the process largely of how the United States goes about that because the current, the current strategy is to unilaterally change the deal by the United States with the support of the Europeans uh, and the exclusion of Iran uh, and its uh, international partners for getting to that deal. But at the end of the day, what's of highest concern is, I would say, it's not the contours of the nuclear deal. It's not any of the elements of the nuclear deal. It's the very politicization of the JCPOA, of the nuclear deal. It's that politicization that's sending the signal that the problem of the deal isn't the technical nuclear issues of the deal. The problem of the deal is that the United States negotiated with Iran. And that's what's wrong. So what President Obama did was it created a political fissure in the US, in the US establishment of how to address the question of Iran. Do you negotiate with Iran? Do you speak with your adversary? Or do you pursue regime change? So we see that larger discussion and debate take different sides between the Trump administration and the Obama administration on the political issue of can we even accept an Islamic Republic of Iran or not, which goes back to the decades-long hostilities between the three countries. And finally, on where is Russia-Iran relations going to go into the future and the scenarios of, of post-JCPOA period, I mean, the Supreme Leader has said, along with other top officials, that uh, Iran should shift to the east. Now, what that necessarily means, um, or what, how that can be done, is very uncertain. But there is this view that engagement to the West, in particular to the United States, has not been successful. <coughs> that in a context of Iran's foreign policy since the revolution, being neither East nor West, of minimizing the role, perhaps, of the West in that equation, of, and enabling the role of the East, meaning Russia, and in particular China, will become much more important to Iran. Um, and if Iran chooses to stick with the deal, even if the US leaves, um, it will need that rebalancing, or it will need that support from Russia and China, more so than, than ever, to, to protect the international credibility of the deal. So I think irrespective of even perhaps any frictions or tensions that may exist in Syria or open up, I think the larger geostrategic geo direction that Iran will be looking to is for increased collaboration, cooperation with Russia and China vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. Thank you. I, should we uh, continue with Nikolai from that question, uh, um, Russia and Iran beyond Syria? Yeah, I completely agree with my colleague. Um, I just wanted to mm, ask one question, actually, to myself, to the audience, but actually, uh, does Russia have capacities to help Iran to bypass sanctions? I mean, economically, uh, the Russian, uh, uh, Russia has definitely limits, uh, and it's very well understood by uh, the Iranians, not saying that even being under the sanctions itself, 
uh, the Russian uh, themselves, the Russian companies are currently discussing what they should do if the, the, the sanctions um, against the uh, against uh, the Islamic Republic will be restored. Should they continue working with Iran or step back in order to be on the safe side? So, from this point of view, the extraterritorial nature of uh, the U.S. sanctions it, uh, can also affect the, the the behavior of the Russian, uh, for instance, energy companies, as it did uh, previously. Um, and uh, it's quite well understood in Tehran from my point of view. So if we uh, read and listen to what was said by the Iranian officials in the recent days and weeks, they were saying that the key factor for preserving the GCPA will be not Russia or even China, it will be Euro the Europeans and their stance on, on, uh, on, the, uh, on the deal. If they leave the deal, then Iran will have incentives to also not to stick to, 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 to the parameters. Uh, speaking about the uh, general drivers of Russian-Iranian cooperation, from my point of view, um, we definitely uh, uh, won't see them reaching the stage of a real alliance. For now, the, the Russian-Iranian cooperation is extremely occasional. So Moscow and uh, Tehran, they, they indeed can have a really good dialogue on a number of issues. But their stances, they are not 100% uh, compliant. So, and the, the difference, they the, the pump up um, uh, occasionally. Uh, there is also another factor, the factor of uh, third countries. So neither Russia nor Iran are interested in a full-fledged alliance because it will definitely backfire to their relations or with um, other players. Uh, in case of Russia, it will definitely aggravate relations with Israel, uh, another country which is quite important for Moscow. Um, it will definitely backfire at Russian-Saudi dialogue. Uh, and if we look back at the, the, the previous five years, we could see that the main Moscow task in the region was basically balancing between the, 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 the key players um, uh, in the region. Yet at the same time, there is uh, one strong driver that uh, exists for these relations and as the factor of the neighborhood. Uh, I definitely know that mm, my Ukrainian colleagues, or the Bo mm, citizens of the Baltic states, would, or Georgia, would disagree that it's an advantage being neighbor with Russia. But um, in case of uh, Iran, uh, for the last, uh, well, I guess since 1946, uh, this neighborhood was an advantage. Um, uh, when Moscow and Iran had quite a huge list of questions on which they uh, had to and have to uh, talk. And in certain cases, in quite a large number of cases, uh, they came to a conclusion that it's much more important to, uh, to, to work out the common position than to argue about. Um, uh, and uh, I guess this will create the, the, the base for, for the continuing, uh, continuation of the dialogue. Uh, the only thing which is needed for, for the two is definitely patience. And for now, the Supreme Leader gave his direct order to, 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 to be more, um, to, 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 de uh, to develop relations with Russia and to ignore some of the irritants they, that can't pop, uh, they can pop up in the dialogue between the two. Um, just brief points about the, the Iran and Shanghai cooperation organization, as the, the Russia is a part of it. Um, it's interesting that uh, during the Ahmadinejad era, uh, Russia was strongly opposing to, to, to Iran joining uh, this organization, not in the last term that Moscow didn't want such a well, uh, country with huge troubles uh, in relations with the West uh, joining it. And it even initiated the, the adoption of the principle that not a country under the sanctions could be a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organizations. Uh, well, could, could, cannot apply. So it can be the member if, if, they, if they impose later. Um, so uh, and Ahmadinejad wanted to join this organization as a way to bypass the sanctions. Currently, it's all vice versa. Russia wouldn't mind having Iran in the organization in order to have an additional means of influence on that. But um, my reading of Tehran that it is quite cautious about joining the organization as uh, the, the, the participation of Russia at certain anti-Western sentiments in that. And, more, uh, and Tehran doesn't want to become a part of the alliance who, which is against, aimed against the, the, the West, could be a, a, a targeted against the West. 
um, at least it's the perception from Tehran, uh, and also the uh, uh, structure where Tehran will be playing uh, the secondary roles. As the Iranians, they largely consider the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as the organization dominated by, uh, first of all, China and in the second turn, uh, Russia. Thank you, and I think the last question goes to Mr. Ho, the questions on how peaceful China will be in the future. Whether China is a peaceful power, I think you're right to look 20, 50 years down the road. And 20, 50 years down the road, you will probably see China, which is more militarized and having a greater reach. I would say the way to think about it is to think that, um, think of this uh, maxim, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And with respect to the South China Sea, uh, China has been building guns around the South China Sea, as you correctly observe. The uh, judgment of the American uh, generals now is that China has locked down the South China Sea, and if the United States wanted to push back China, it would have to be a war. Uh, failing that, they will, uh, they will cede the South China Sea to, to China. I think that is the US judgment currently. Um, beyond the South China Sea, China has only knives, not guns. So they will not bring a knife to a gunfight. At this point, 20 years time, 50 years time, it may probably look quite different. With respect to uh, Iran, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, AIIB in the Middle East, I think uh, yes, definitely, Iran should join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, it's part of what I call this reorientation uh, to see yourself as part of West Asia. Uh, Iran is actually late to the game because Turkey has already done it. Turkey expanded over the carcass of the crumbling Soviet Union towards Central Asia. Your Anatolian Tigers went out there. The Gulen movement went out there. And I think that was the basis for the building of Turkish Airlines, which claims to have the most uh, destinations. That was the basis of the what was called the new Ottoman Turkey. Uh, so Turkey actually uh, was ahead of the game. Uh, Iran played a different game. Iran went for Shia pockets, which was in the end a patchwork, uh, patchwork uh, game through what is now called the Shia Crescent. It did not go into Central Asia, but it's never too late. I think you can uh, do this. And I think this reorientation towards Central Asia, towards West Asia, away from something like Syria would be uh, very good for, 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 for Iran. Um, there is, that's the northern tier. The southern tier, when you talk about things like uh, investments, investment bank, there is a southern tier I've mentioned. Uh, this would be countries like Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and so on. This would be the maritime uh, route. If you think of this maritime route, what do you have? China shares with the Gulf countries wealth funds, surplus wealth. It shares with um, these governments, authoritarian style of government, very compatible. And so that sets up a very uh, great potential for partnership. Now, I would think of these partnerships in terms of platforms, like a Dubai, a Singapore, a Beirut, even a Bahrain, where if you think of reconstruction in Syria, in Iraq, you don't have to build from those places. You can operate from a Dubai, a Beirut, Bahrain, and so on. And those small places actually can wield a lot of uh, power. You can have, for example, uh, infrastructure finance. First level, infrastructure finance, first round has to be a political component because people are not willing to uh, lose money. A political in, uh, component which could in uh, involve, so for example, Islamic financing. Uh, both sides put in skin in the game. When you have Islamic financing, a second round could bring in retail investors on Islamic finance. Uh, you could start building things like uh, a legal infrastructure for the Belt and Road, which does not exist at the moment. Things like arbitration, you could do it in Dubai, you could do it in Qatar, and uh, perhaps other places. So these small places can have key roles to play. Uh, and if I think of it in this way, then um, um, I go back to what I said in my presentation. On both Iran looking, towards, looking at itself as West Asia, the um, maritime countries looking to the Indian Ocean, 
what you're talking about is the possibility of investments, trade, profit over decades. And I, I think, I hope that uh, this will help the Middle Eastern countries look outwards rather than inwards towards a zero-sum game. Thank you. Um, we already went over time, so I want to thank all my panelists for this great so I th I, yeah, true, I should give you one last word. I'm sorry, because there are Ranj and Professor Gatha didn't get to speak, I'm sorry. Because we just went over time, so I was like, uh, word. yeah, please. Very brief, uh, yeah, of course, please. Uh, j just to uh, follow on from uh, Payam's comments on and Magdalena's question, uh, I think I agree with Payam that Iran and the US can with each other in the region, but under whose terms? That's the question, really. Uh, the view from Washington is that you've got an actor that since the late 70s, 80s has been proactive, rather interventionist, uh, hypocritical in its calls for non-interference, but yet has inter inter interfered, intervened uh, immensely in its region. Uh, whereas the view from Tehran is that it's faced genuine, imminent threats to its national security as a consequence of Western involvement, engagement in Iraq, in Afghanistan. Geographic proximity plays a big role uh, in all this. Uh, so really the question is, uh, how, how can you provide some sort of uh, inducement for the two sides to reach some kind of agreement? Uh, Iran will not provide any concessions in relation to its gains in Iraq and Syria, not only because it's a highly fragmented environment, uh, but, but, but also because these are hard fought for gains that they've made in Syria. Why should they withdraw the tens of thousands of militia groups they've deployed in Syria? Is it even possible? The same goes to uh, Iraq. Uh, whereas with the U.S., uh, I think there will be a pushback against all this. Hence the, uh, the, the skepticism that I, that I had uh, in, my, in my presentation. Yeah, I think, you know, ultimately China will move very incrementally and cautiously in the Middle East because of the insecurity complex, the great volatility uncertainty. Um, and it has very few historical points of reference in the region, you know, other than establishing formal diplomatic relations with uh, Egypt in 1956. Uh, if you compare that to Africa, you know, Afro-Asian solidarity is grounded in the principles of Bandung. Uh, 1973, there were some, you know, 20, 20 uh, odd countries that gave affirmative votes to China so that it could get it the permanent seat under the UN Security Council. And since 1978, you know, very robust building of bilateral chemistry with African countries such that now there are 52 countries that have official relations with China, uh, only two with Taiwan. And that, in a sense, has formed uh, the essential platform for, for the establishment of a continent-wide forum, the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation, which was established by Wu Jintao uh, in 2000, such that you know, um, it's become the quintessential touchstone for an explosion of trade and commercial relations between China and Africa. Uh, China is now Africa's largest trading partner, having now eclipsed both the United States uh, and the European Union. And the interesting thing, as a final point, is that FOCAC, the Forum for China, Corpor uh, China Africa Cooperation, has very much served as a platform for improved intra-African dialogue such that last year um, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, the CFTA, which was unthinkable like 10 years ago, uh, has been established as a way of improving you know, the quantum of intra-regional trade and China stands to benefit greatly from that engagement, particularly in addressing you know, the multiple supply side issues and problems and challenges. Thank you so much. I mean, so that the China-Africa relations is a lot grounded in the Middle East. That means we are looking for a much longer uh, term in the future. Um, and the panel definitely left us with more curious questions. And uh, hopefully we'll continue with these in the future. I want to again thank all my panelists for their great contribution. Um, everyone who joined us. Um, I have a couple short announcements. Um, we have lunch break now until 3 p.m. At 3 p.m. we have two another parallel sessions. Uh, one of them is on the um, regional rivalries, uh, strife and security quagmire, uh, the case of Yemen. Um, that is going to be downstairs in the main room. And here in this room will be the, um, the, the energy session, energy and security challenges for the Middle East. And that's going to be here. 
Thank you.